I can hear, but I really have to make an effort to listen. <laughs> Have you have you tried uh, connecting headphones or a headset? No, it should work without it. It's, okay. I have a perfect <laughs> setup. It's some, something. Okay, j just a second. I will get some help. Did we lose Mr. Mikas? Oh, no, you're here, sorry. <laughs> On the left of my screen, I hadn't seen you there. Okay, just so everyone, um, we have interpretation here with us today. You'll see uh, inter one and inter two, those are our interpreters, so hi to them. Um, we have interpretation from English to Lithuanian and Lithuanian to English here today. Um, if you click on the globe at the bottom of your screen, bottom right, it says interpretation, um, and you click there and you can decide what language you would like to listen to this event in. Uh, please note that unfortunately Zoom doesn't have an option for Lithuanian. Um, they haven't gotten there yet. So if you click French, French is the equivalent of Lithuanian for us today. So just click French if you want to listen to this in Lithuanian. And for those of you who are English speakers and need translation from Lithuanian, just select the EN English button. Let me repeat these instructions in Lithuanian. That would be great. Need. That would be great. Good afternoon. As you have just heard from Claire, she told you how to activate the interpretation buttons. Those who want to hear the Lithuanian language have to find the button that is down in the bottom, at the bottom of your page right corner and you will be able to choose from english or french unfortunately zoom does not provide the lithuanian language therefore we have chosen french instead of lithuanian but you will be hearing the lithuanian thank you uh Darius Vitautas, how long would you like to give people to come in? How long should we wait, in your opinion? Maybe two more minutes? I think that since uh, the translation is, uh, the the YouTube uh, is on, uh, same as uh, is watching, so I guess we could start already. Because okay. it's three minutes after three. Okay, perfect, and the floor is yours. Okay, so... Um, uh, thank you all for for coming. Thank you for for giving me word. I'm I'm very glad we are talking here today uh, in in the parliament, and there is a possibility to discuss and to listen to the um, new uh, uh, new OECD uh, brief about Lithuanian legislature and uh, uh, the policy evaluation at the center of government in Lithuania. Uh, for everyone, uh, since uh, there are some and not so uh, not so little Lithuanians 
uh, listening to us, I would like to give my opening remarks in Lithuanian, if that would be okay for everyone. So, tai sveiki visi. Sveiki visi susirinkę. Welcome once again. I am very happy to have the debate on legislation and on evidence-based policy making and policy evaluation in the Lithuanian Parliament. I'd like to share my insights before the uh, report will be introduced to all of you. Uh, as you're going to listen to the uh, speakers both from Lithuania and from the OECD. When we are talking about the quality of public administration, we still have to admit that the topic is sometimes understood uh, well, even more often, uh, the topic is understood in uh, too a narrow sense. We look at the laws through the procedures that are uh, debated uh, or taken place in the Lithuanian Parliament. Uh, citizens usually um, see uh, the legislative process again differently, but I believe that the quality of decisions is of crucial importance for Lithuania. It has been mentioned on numerous times on, uh, by numerous uh, experts that we have the problem of legislative inflation, that the public administration is not effective. We do talk a lot about added value, and if we are not able to transform public administration, uh, we'll not, we will not be able to catch up with the whole of the world. Not only economic growth, but also the, the health of our population, as well as other social and many other aspects are important when dealing with the fact whether our country is able to make use of the evidence-based uh, approach. We have to ensure that we have the capacities to make decisions, to analyze. We have to ensure that we adopt informed decisions. We have to look uh, whether we know how to make use of the cost-benefit um, analysis to be able to compare the figures and indicators among the countries. And I believe that there is no excuse for Lithuania for not adopting evidence-based uh, decisions. I believe that it is the government that has uh, most competencies when it comes to evidence-based capacities. And when it comes to this particular report and this evaluation, uh, I believe they will be able to hear some very good news. Some others will address the issues, the problems that Lithuania is facing. We are organizing this debate uh, to include members of the Lithuanian parliament as they are the ones who adopt uh, legal acts. As it has been mentioned on numerous occasions, the Lithuanian parliament has become uh, the windmill of uh, legal acts. And the previous term has hit the record. For example, in the area of taxation, the previous, in the previous term, uh, term of office, over 400 pieces of legislation were adopted, but only 15% of them undergone impact assessment. I believe this fact is rather painful and it uh, points out to the problem that we have here in Lithuania. We need to ensure evidence-based policy in all areas of our lives because it is of crucial importance. If we looked at the total statistics, 
During the previous term, the Lithuanian parliament passed as many as 3,400 legal acts. That is, with 2.3 pieces of legislation adopted every day. Therefore, I believe in the coming future, once we hear the uh, recommendations, once we hear the assessment uh, from the OECD uh, representatives, uh, I will initiate certain amendments to the statute of the same as of the Republic of Lithuania. I have already debated this issue with the chairs of uh, um, SAMUS committees, and I'm very happy that the chair of the Committee on Legal Affairs, Mr. Shedbaras, is with us today. We have also talked uh, about this issue, and we believe that committees should be more empowered when it comes to adopting evidence-based policy and in uh, drafting and preparing various mechanisms that are necessary for evidence-based policy making and policy evaluation. If we achieve that, then we will be able to pursue other objectives such as transparency uh, and we will be able to declare the intent of every law, of every specific law. So I hope that we will be able to introduce the dedicated amendments in the statute of the same as of the Republic of Lithuania. Uh, I hope that we will achieve that. And today, I am very happy that we have an opportunity together with the OECD experts to look at the work that has been completed. Listening for, for, uh, for, for my introductory remarks and I switch back to English and, uh, and uh, please, uh, uh, Claire, uh, continue moderating our meeting. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, I think Darius, um, you wanted to say a few words to complement what has just been said. Thank you very much, Claire, uh, dear colleagues. Um, I, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Deputy Speaker Vito Tasmidalas for actually initiating it. It's not the first time we are talking about it. We, we had a long conversation back in February about how to improve our legislative process to back it up properly with evidence. I also would like to thank uh, Strata, the Governmental Strategic Analysis Center and colleagues from OECD for providing a good uh, piece of, of food for thought. It's an objective scan, which we can discuss, uh, which we can discuss uh, today. Since we, with the colleagues from OECD and Strata, we, we have discussed it already, I also would like to switch into Lithuania since today's interaction is primarily based with the members of, of parliament and perhaps wider audience. So if you like, allow me, I'll say also a few words in, 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 in Lithuania. Um, May I thank Deputy Speaker the same as Mitalas for the initiative that has been shown. Uh, we have been cooperating uh, together with the Government Strategic Analysis Center, Strata and OECD. My field of competence covers better provision of government with evidence in order to ensure that it adopts uh, informed uh, decisions. As Mikitautas Mikalas has already mentioned, we have already achieved certain things. We have been successful. The government of the Republic of Lithuania has already declared in its working program. I, I do apologize, but someone here has turned on his or her microphone. So, to continue. So, the government of the Republic of Lithuania declared openness for the uh, decisions adopted. Uh, the government has also declared that it will rely on the expert opinion 
as well as other uh, evidence-based uh, policy instruments. But I would also like to note that this government, unlike other previous governments, and I have been working with uh, quite a few governments already, so this government is the one that fully realized the importance of adopting evidence-based uh, policy decisions. So once again, I'd like to just briefly tell you what has already been done. And what we will hear from the OECD experts. First and foremost, we have drafted for the first time uh, the new legislative program for the government. We do understand that it will be adjusted and amended with the time to include uh, some uh, relevant matters later on. But uh, when Mr. Vito Tasnetalas mentioned about the uh, windmill of uh, legislative acts, I believe that we should be ended. Uh, we would like to ensure that every draft legislation uh, is of quality. So I hope that we will succeed in doing this. We'll try to ensure that ministries provide their proposals in a consistent manner rather than the fragmented one. We have had the problems with the fragmented proposals already on numerous occasions. So we have uh, to save time. I believe that we have to ensure proper planning too. I would also like to note that we should engage in a debate as to how we could manage the flow of legislation from the government. Because once laws are amended, the government will still have to adopt its own orders. So we have to make sure that evidence are available. Well, we do have evidence now, but sometimes we uh, do not take care to provide them in a consistent and proper manner. Also, it is important that the legal act is understood not only by the ones who are the drafters of the legal act or members of parliament, decision makers, but also a wider society. So without further ado, I'd like uh, to give the floor to other keynote speakers so that everyone could discuss as to what could be done at the government and parliament level. And I would be very curious to hear the proposals and what the members of the parliament think of those proposals. Thank you. Just to, 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 to hand it over to, to, to Claire for further proceedings. Thank you, Darius. And definitely, I think that sums up sort of the key issues that uh, my colleagues Stefan and Richard will go more in depth um, in later. But before I do that, I just wanted to give the opportunity to Gidrius, uh, who is the director of Strata, to say a few words to sort of set off this interesting discussion. Thank you, Claire. And uh, following previous speakers, I also will address members of parliament in Lithuania. Um, distinguished members of parliament, we are privileged to be among such a uh, esteemed audience, among esteemed experts. Uh, you have mandated Strata two years ago to give uh, the government of the Republic of Lithuania with the evidence necessary. Our organization is important because ministries and other public institutions address uh, to uh, the uh, uh, center in order to get some advice or recommendation. For the recent years, the center has been looking a deeper look at the problems related to legislation and lawmaking in Lithuania. 
we looked at the problems pertaining to the evaluation of uh, policy making in Lithuania, and we thought as to what we could could be done to improve and strengthen the confidence needed for uh, these two things. I believe that the project has helped us to deeper understand the challenges that our lawmaking institutions face with. It was extremely crucial and we do hope that it will be important and significant for the Lithuanian parliament and for the government because both the government and the parliament complement each other and both of them believe that this topic uh, is especially relevant in today's world. We hope that we will adopt the best solutions possible and we are ready to serve you as uh, the source of evidence to you and supporters of this idea. So thank you once again, and we are looking forward to a very interesting debate. Please take over. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, Kinyus. Well, I definitely hope that the esteemed members of parliament who are here with us today uh, will recognize some of the issues and challenges that they encounter in lawmaking and that they will um, see themselves and find themselves in the recommendations that the OECD team are making today. So, Stefan, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you very much, uh, Darius. Thank you very much, uh, esteemed uh, members of parliament. I'm just uh, sharing my screen now. Um, and we will now go to some of the um, uh, core issues that have been shaped as part of this uh, policy paper on behalf of the entire OECD team, including uh, Claire and Richard, even if just Richard and myself will share the presentation today. I also want to thank the Strata colleagues for all the support in the process, as well as the Office of the Government and the wide range of ministries and agencies which have informed this work. Um, what are the contexts and objectives of this work? We need, I mean, we have been invited to promote effective evidence informed policy making in Lithuania as part of the cooperation agreement also with DJ Reform and the TSI instrument of the European Union. The goal is to help governments to face uncertainty, promote flexible responses and greater resilience to the crisis. But let's be real, what's coming next? What's coming next is that there will be a need to administer recovery plans of a magnitude unseen in history called the next generation EU. So they, this will represent one of the largest injection of funds, way larger than even the Marshall Fund, and governments will have to be accountable for these plans and they will have to be able to show that they will deliver results. So that means you will need to engineer evidence and evaluation into these plans, both ex ante to see what can work and also exposed as a way to really uh, see what has worked. The second uh, level of, um, uh, in terms of context, is that this feeds into the government, the new government work program. And we heard from Mr. Darius Holis some of the new initiatives, including in terms of trying to structure, having a structured agenda for, for uh, uh, lawmaking in the current uh, government uh, plan. I think one of the issues that we wanted also to draw your attention to from a longer term, because we are here now in early 2021, but I have been at the OECD many years, and we know that all of the countries that have experienced regulatory inflation in the longer term have seen their growth rates suffer, have seen their long-term prospects for prosperity suffer because of a range of issues. And we think that this is a big challenge because if you have too many laws with too little evidence that can prove a very toxic mix both for your economy and also the uh, social fabric of your country. Um, our report will go into a number of, uh, of suggestions for updating government machinery and oversight for preparing and assessing regulations. And I'm very grateful that our OECD expert in uh, um, better regulation, Richard Alcorn, will share some of these results with you today. The goal is to both increase the supply and the demand for evaluation, uh, the supply in terms of skills and capacity and the demand at the political level, and which is also one of the reasons why we're engaging with parliament today. We are looking at these um, evidence-informed policy-making agenda 
at three levels following the OECD frameworks for building capacity for evidence-informed policy making, both at the level of individual skills of civil servants, individuals working in the government, but also at the organizational structures of government and also the overall institutional and policy frameworks. So um, this is, there are a few more words on these slides, but this is the main idea is that you cannot just look at individuals, you have to look at the system and you have to think as to how the system works in terms of government and the executive, of course, but we will come back to issues related more closely to parliament in a minute. Yes, and so why do we have to engage with parliament? I mean, parliament has an obvious role. Parliament is, is approving laws, is approving the budget. And um, we thought it was important to share interest and vision on the key objectives and measures to promote evidence and evaluation with members of parliament. And um, Parliament has, in many countries, Parliaments can use the impact assessment that are prepared by the government for new laws as a way to stimulate deba debate on policy options and inform the democratic debate in Parliament. And um, we also think that in the case of Lithuania, the, the problem is a bit deeper than what we thought, because in fact, we somehow came to the conclusion that even the academic system in Lithuania does not fully provide the sort of skills that would be useful and important for the government to fully fulfill its mission. Up to the fact, for example, that the Bank of Lithuania, which is a large and well-resourced organization, has had to set up its own academic program to train professional economists. And we think that um, there are broader implications than just thinking about the skills of civil servants but it's also upskilling uh, at the broader level some of the academia as well. And Parliament, as I have mentioned, has a key role as a user of evaluation and evidence, discussing the impact assessments. But also, we know that in many other countries which have parliamentary budget offices, you can use time in parliaments to discuss the evaluation of public policies. The French Parliament has now a spring of evaluation. You have very strong parliamentary mechanisms for discussion in countries such as as diverse as Ireland or Korea, and Parliament can have an important role to play as a way to keep the government accountable for its mission, to look at what are the results of public policies, how these policies have been evaluated, and what can be done to fix them. That's part of the democratic debate. So um, let me now turn to the um, some of the substantive issues of our analysis. The first is the severe implications of uh, legal inflation. Lithuania, from what we have seen, is driven by a legalistic culture, also a culture in which performance of parliamentarians is perceived as being indicated by the quantity of legislation that they're involved in. And you're not the only country with that. In my country, you know, every parliamentarian who succeeds in getting a law approved will have its name attached to the law. So that's the law X, the law of Mr. X. And, and that, in a sense, is for people a way to make their careers. But this is fine to have laws when they are useful. When you have too many laws accumulating, accumulated one on each other, they can become uh, counterproductive. Here, the team has put together this chart based on information from your Supreme Audit Office that Lithuania apparently is producing 700 laws a year against 200 for Estonia and 400 for Latvia. If you were to look at the GDP per capita in these three small Baltic states, which have had in recent years the same trajectory, I am not sure that this is exactly proportionally related to the number of laws. So you have to think as to whether you are making yourself happy and well equipped by voting all these laws. And the problem is made a little bit worse because you don't have a systematic revisions on the stock of legislation. The more you do laws, the more they accumulate uh, one on each other. And, and there have been, there are some technical issues, I will say a word in a minute, about trying to address the stock of new laws. This creates excessive regulatory burdens also creates opportunities for lack of compliance. We understand that Lithuania is one of the countries in Europe with one of the highest shares of the informal economy. Because of course, when there are too many rules and regulations that people do not understand, then they just go informal. At least there is a risk. And we know that in all of the countries which are overly legalistic, um, this risk of the informal economy and lack of compliance exists. And there has also been a lack of sufficient forward planning, even if steps are currently being taken at the moment to address that. So um, in terms of addressing the challenges of legal inflation, this is 
this is really a structural issue and Richard will, will show you what can be done at the level of the machinery of government in terms of impact assessment and so forth. But I think there are broader challenges. For example, we will be mentioning in the report the, the tool of codification, but many countries which have used codification have a different constitutional framework, which allows the government to take decree laws that means to replace stock of, of existing laws by one new decree law. And apparently this possibility to do a decree law, which exists in countries such as France of it, or Italy, given their legal system, does not exist in Lithuania at the, pro at the moment, which deprives the government and the country of a useful tool to manage the stock. The second thing is there is a need to review the process for implementing EU directives, tools and methods, because this represents half of the stock of new regulation and there is some scope for progress there. But there is also beyond these measures, the need to think strategically about as, as to how to address these long-term challenges. And we think here that, of course, we at the OECD cannot give recommendations to parliament, but we can invite you to think we are here to help the government reform itself, but as this is part of the governance framework for the country, we, in our report, we, for example, make a suggestion that there should be a memorandum of understanding between the government and the parliament on these issues. And um, I was very happy to hear that Mr. Mitalas mentioned that the parliament is very conscious of this challenge at the moment and that you are thinking of updating, if I am not mistaken, the statutes or the, the books of the parliaments, the rules of procedures of the parliaments to try to address that. And we also suggest in the report, there are broader longer term issues that could deserve a strategic task force to th rethink the future of the Lithuanian framework. As I have mentioned, you can be here now, next year and two years, but over 10 to 15 years, there will be huge hidden costs for this regulatory inflation. So while we can use tools at the level, at the technical level of a given government legislature, I do really believe that's my role as an OECD analyst, that uh, there is a need for some more structural fixes that go beyond even some of the measures that we can envisage in the current report. We can maybe discuss that as part of the discussion. Now I have the pleasure to leave the floor to uh, Richard Alcon to go into uh, some of the uh, further aspects of the regulatory frameworks. Richard, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, yes, I work in the OECD Regulatory Policy Division, and uh, Stefan and everybody else has set the scene very nicely on the overall challenges, in particular leg uh, reg uh, legislative inflation. So uh, I'm focusing on the particular challenges at the more technical level of the regulatory uh, framework. So uh, jumping into our OECD assessment of uh, our issues around the regulatory process, so we have found that the, rec the process for making new regulations, it lacks sufficient forward planning and management. So uh, there's an insufficient time built into the legislative process for ministries to carry out comprehensive ex ante regulatory impact assessment or RIA and comprehensive uh, stakeholder engagement. And this limits the opportunity for these tools to inform the development of new legislative proposals and may even lead to a uh, bias towards uh, legislative solutions for policy problems. Part of the reason for this may be the legal framework on the uh, yeah. Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, which uh, some of us may be driven by the legislative legal development implementation plan only three months after the Parliament has approved the program for the government. Uh, there have been some improvements to the RIA process since 2015, but Exactly, RIAs have still not systematically carried out. They're still viewed by officials as an administrative burden rather than a valuable tool for decision making. Uh, RIA does not appear to be undertaken at an early stage of the policy process when there's a genuine interest in uh, identifying the best available solution, and assessments are rarely based on hard data or an, uh, analysis of different options. There are also few internal guidelines in ministries or clear processes to support officials with carrying out RIA. And there can be multiple sources of methodological guidance and it can be unclear for officials which one they're supposed to use and staff often do not have much support in their own ministries to carry out RIAs. The consultation process in Lithuania is quite well established within the policy making process uh, so there's an expectation that officials are supposed to carry out consultation alongside uh, 
impact assessments. Uh, however, um, there's mixed evidence as to how effective this has been. We've heard that often uh, uh, the different documents uh, that are supposed to be published online as part of consultations are missing, and uh, the full RIA analysis will not be published to inform the consultation. The Office for the Government has developed methodological guidance for consultation, although its use by ministries is voluntary. Uh, well, we've seen some interesting practices, such as in the Ministry of Social Affairs and Labour, where they, they established a process whereby individual policy units drafting legislation can request their strategic decision support and international cooperation group to assist them with carrying out RIA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Stefan, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so in order to address these issues, we're recommending that the Lithuanian government consider setting up a forward planning system. So this forward plan would, would involve a clear 18-month ruling calendar uh, that the government would publish online and update annually for the development of new uh, primary and secondary legislation. It would be coherent with the programme for the government for the political term, and it would set out the time implications for the government to undertake necessary stakeholder consultation and uh, ex ante RIA. Uh, we also feel we, we have to enhance the effectiveness of the RIA system in order to improve legislative quality. So we want to establish an effective two-tier RIA system, and this would build on the recent reforms introduced in 2018, where the Office for the Government has been drawing up a semi-annual list of high uh, impact legislation and we want to have uh, we want to establish a system where a uh, real uh, uh, resource is funneled towards uh, those pieces of legislation that are estimated to have the highest impact on society so we'd have high and low impact uh, RIAs. we also feel further clarify RIA procedures and practices uh, to make it uh, easier for ministries to understand what they're supposed to do and work with strata to develop tools to facilitate RIA, such as digital tools. Uh, there could be clearer methodological guidelines and tra trainings and tools. And uh, within ministries, the process for preparing RIA and new proposals could be up for some clarification. And there should be clear points of contact that individual policy teams making new laws should be able to go to to ask for uh, advice. Uh, we also feel a, a, a new RIA community practice should be established, coordinated by the Office of Government where different ministries and policy teams can share best practice. And the Strata can further build on its current work to develop systematic and permanent training programs and, uh, on, on RIA. And, and also on public consultation, there are some measures that we re recommend to improve, enhance public consultation, such as uh, minimum periods for consultation to be carried out. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so there are well-established processes in Lithuania for the transfer, uh, for negotiation and the transposition of uh, EU law into domestic law, and the transposition process for EU directives is well established. So and we know the European Union Legal Group in the, of the Ministry of Justice is the main institution that coordinates and monitors transposition using the uh, electronic system. Uh, However, as EU directives are transposed into national law, they'll be subject to the same obligations for ex ante RIA as domestic law, and therefore subject to the same shortcomings I, I previously mentioned. Uh, we know that the European Union Legal Group is responsible for reducing during the process of EU transposition, uh, uh, an issue referred to as gold plating. However, the, the EU Legal Group it may lack sufficient resourcing to sufficiently oversee and scrutinize the transposition process, including controlling the issue of gold plating across the government. And this may be, this may be one of the factors contributing to uh, legislative inflation. Next slide, please. So our, our recommendations to address uh, this particular issue are in order to strengthen the coordination of the transposition process in the government, the Lithuanian government should review the transposition process and consider whether responsibilities for coordinating transposition should be consolidated with the Office for the Government, who will have a better strate strategic view uh, of the different ministries and be able to exercise control uh, over the legislative agendas of other ministries. All also, the capacity of the European Union legal group in the Ministry of Justice sh should be reviewed to examine whether they require any additional resourcing for undertaking quality control of transposed legislation 
with a view to limiting possibilities for gold plating. Next slide, please. And the issue of uh, regulatory oversight or quality control. So uh, we find a quality control of, of new re regulatory proposals remains fragmented and somewhat inadequate. There are some quality controls existing. I mentioned that since 2018, the Office of the Government has drawn up a semi-annual list of draft legislation considered to be higher impact in, to uh, oversee the quality of RIAs uh, uh, developed for these draft high impact law and it provides advice to the government on whether these uh, RIAs are of sufficient, qu sufficient quality. We also know that all legislative proposals undergo a thorough legal quality check by the Ministry of Justice. However, responsibilities for quality assurance are dispersed through different parts of the government and we feel that collectively they remain insufficient to improve the quality of legislation. Next slide, please. So our recommendation to uh, strengthen quality assurance processes, we recommend investment, uh, well, uh, firstly, there's a, I referred uh, that we recommend investment upstream to build analytical capacity within ministries for carrying out raids, but also we feel we should strengthen the quality assurance process downstream to establishing a proper, what we call a regulatory oversight board of uh, independent experts uh, and a strengthened oversight of real processes by the office uh, of the government. So this regulatory oversight board could be tasked with carrying out quality control of exactly real documents for the high impact reads, as well as providing publicly available advice on the quality of reads, which would have to be shared uh, with parliament. And this advice could confirm whether due process and the core steps of the real process has been carried out. And the Office for the Government would send the Oversight Board's official advice to the government in a public manner before the law has been transmitted to Parliament. Uh, and the Oversight Body could also provide regular assessments of the overall quality of the real process across government and publish these findings. Uh, and Strata could be established as a secretariat for this board. However, we want to emphasise that this new regulatory oversight board does not uh, imply setting up a expensive new agency, uh, but, uh, but we feel it's important that an uh, independent voice, a panel of, uh, of uh, external experts is set up who will have credibility in the eyes of stakeholders and help hold the rest of the government's feet to the fire for improving the quality of the uh, regulatory process. And lastly, uh, we also recommend streamlining quality control and coordination functions between the Office for Government and the Ministry of Justice. Uh, I mentioned before the, the fragmentation of different aspects of quality uh, uh, assurance. We think there, there appears to be a scope for stream, streamlining certain quality control functions between the Office for Government and the Ministry of Justice, and so there appears to be some overlaps in the current mandates of the two institutions. I feel that Lithuania could consider implementing a two-level quality control check of the analytical context of exactly is. And uh, the first level of scrutiny uh, covering the majority of legislative proposals could be carried out in-house in by ministries. Uh, and the Ministry of Justice will continue to deal with uh, uh, legal aspects of quality control, while the Office for Government would deal with the quality of RIAs. However, for high-impact legislative proposals, the independent regulatory oversight Board to provide publicly available advice on the quality of the corresponding RIAs. So uh, that was a lot to take in, and uh, it's goes into more detail in the report, but I'll pass back to Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, mm -hmm. And we will now go back to the border issues of uh, capacity gaps. As is mentioned, this is less the the direct concern of the, of the parliament, but there are remaining gaps within the government. Even if the law of the government on July 16, 2019 gives Strata a mandate to provide advice in the form of analytical and methodological support for the government, there are lacks of skills and evaluation and quantitative analysis across many of the ministries and agencies and major capacity gaps inside the government. And in terms of the demand for evaluation, it exists, but it is not sufficient. It is also at some point hindered by heavy or sometimes inadequate uh, processes, for example, for strategic planning, and also by a perception that evaluation is a formal requirement and rather a crucial tool for reaching trusted evidence-informed uh, decisions. So 
decision-making processes will need to embed use of evaluation further in the future. We met uh, many Lithuanian ministries uh, over our missions, at least a dozen of them. And in many cases, analytical resources are dispersed through line departments and policy units. There are very few units dedicated entirely for analysis, and they're often, often overburdened with managerial and political tasks. And um, in some ministries, there are significant portions of analytical capacity, but they are in subordinate institutions, such as in the Lithuanian Energy Agency or Invest Lithuania, which are very decently equipped organizations. But uh, some of the ministries you need, on the other hand, they have skills gap. We saw units with some post unfilled because they couldn't simply not find the right person and with people working very much in isolation. There is no definition of analytical staff in the Lithuanian public sector. It's difficult even to evaluate the real analytical capacities and establish who is responsible for generating evidence. Uh, we see that the training programs of ministries are organized in silos and um, that uh, there is beyond the public sector in the academia, a limited supply of analytical specialists in Lithuania and a lack of expertise in quantitative economics. And um, we know that even if the Ministry of the Interior is working to modernize the civil service frameworks with a competencies-based approach, this has not yet reached the uh, issue of the very specific needs of the uh, analytical track. So um, what can we do about that? We uh, suggest to invest in skills by creating an analytical track or a group or a profession of people inside the civil service, which the task uh, whose mission will be to work in economics, statistics, and data science. And for those of you, I am a French person, I can tell you that something that France did in 1944, that was one of the lessons of the last war for my country, that we realized that we had to modernize our statistical apparatus and create a modern economics analysis schools and equip the state with a decent corpus of economists and statisticians. The UK has had economic analytical professions for years and they have analytical professions covering economies, statistics, data science and social sciences. And we also did work as on another example with a country like Ireland, which felt the same capacity gaps as Lithuania after the global financial crisis, which had hit, hit hard. And they did um, create and set up over a period of 10 years, a pretty admirable system of the Irish Government Economic Evaluation Service, and we will have capacity building webinars later this week with uh, teams of uh, Lithuanian experts and civil servants where the head of the Irish Government Economic Evaluation Service will share a few thoughts. We also would think that there is a need to cooperate with the Bank of Lithuania, which has up to now built a master's, a, a bachelor's degree in economics at the university level to build a real master's program for economic and quantitative analysis. Um, that could entail some cooperation between the bank and, for example, Strata. And the idea is that the government would become a client of this program for a certain proportion of the graduates, not all of them, because many of them can also be exported in the private sector in issues in sectors such as insurance, banking, or, or large energy companies. We would also suggest to develop a scholarship program where, in the short term, until this master's program becomes operational, some young Lithuanian people can be given an opportunity to study study abroad, but with the obligation to come back. That means the government will be sponsoring their studies, but that create a debt and the debt will be reimbursed by working for the government. And for those of you who don't mean know so well, this is what happened to me in France. I worked for the government as a government economist. My studies were paid. I even got some form of a stipend when I was a student, but in exchange, I had to work for the government for eight years. So that's some form of a give and give relationship. Of course, in the modern world where a lot of workers are mobile, that can be a bit challenging, but this is the idea. And we also suggest to promote a whole of government approach in managing analytical tasks. And we also suggest to strengthen analytical capacities in ministries and agencies through a number of um, specific uh, aspects to map skills, to strengthen training and so forth. So um, another side of this agenda, you have to invest in human skills, but you also have to invest in, in data. And data is the new oil in government. Data is a source of wealth and knowledge. And governments often 
do not realize that one of their key assets in, in, in modern history is their data and digital architecture. And we again see some progress, but uh, still many challenges in terms of access to high quality data. We saw that statistics Lithuania has a relatively narrowly defined notion of the official statistics program. The registries are managed separately. There is no government mechan wide mechanisms to share data. Of course, and then to access merge data sets and do high quality analysis, we realize that Strata can do that, but in many cases, we saw in ministries and analytical, small analytical units in ministries who had no access, no idea as to who they, how they could access these things. So there are still significant gaps and um, there are lacks of data on social indicators such as economic and other data. Of course, the COVID-19 crisis has had beneficial effects because it has forced the government to mobilize a lot of data quickly because they had to somehow monitor the situation. But of course, our report is not mandated to focus on the data issues, but we think that they cannot just be forgotten. So we have just framed one recommendation to develop a clear data governance framework so that data will be available for applied analysis. Um, now, um, in terms of uh, after having addressed supply, we want to look at the use of evaluation. And there are different ways in which use and demand can be strengthened. The first is ensuring publicity and transparency in communication. And we're very grateful to the same as today, the parliament that it has decided to uh, make this uh, session live on, um, on uh, Twitter and uh, say hi to all of the people who watch us through video and TV, hoping that this works fine. But we also uh, um, realize that, so there are some features for publication in the current system of evaluation in Lithuania. For example, the management of EU structural funds is a bright spot, but these are fragmented, isolated, and there is overall relatively limited uh, communication about them. Another dimension is all these core processes, such as performance, budgeting, performance, audits, strategic planning, which could embed evidence as a way to inform um, policy decisions or spending reviews. But, um, but there is uh, the evidence is not being supplied. And at the moment, many of these tools are not properly integrating evidence. And uh, the report goes into more detail, for example, in terms of the, uh, the content of the regulatory impact assessment processes. So um, the report suggests that to increase demand for evidence, you need to uh, create systematic feedback loops, for example, to uh, improve the communication of evidence with infographics, with engagement on the social media, to provide also access to evaluations with a searchable well portal for the government evaluations. Lithuania is not such a huge country, so you could well imagine that you could create a portal, maybe building on the existing uh, portal for structural funds, where you would put a searchable um, uh, word, uh, PDF format um, files that uh, could give people access. And also, uh, we suggest to develop a government-wide policy framework for evaluation, and uh, we suggest to conduct spending reviews on a systematic basis, and also to leverage parliament. And this is where you will come in. We think that parliament, and we are grateful for the opportunity today for the discussion with some members of parliament of the OECD diagnostic assessment and recommendations. We think that in many countries, parliaments can play a very important role. For example, mobilizing the use of evaluations, performance audit, impact assessments for parliamentary discussions. You have a wealth of information, you have to use it. And if the information is used, then it will improve its quality. It will stimulate demand for the data and the ecosystem will improve itself. We also realize that in Lithuania, the government has, a few, has some very high quality units of information and research. And I realize that in the audience today, we have a number of people who are the members of the office of the same as, and, and we know that they have a role to play. We also think that parliament can increase demand by including systematically evaluation clauses in laws to create evaluation once the laws in passed. And also uh, to uh, think about evaluations while designing policies. So uh, just before concluding, uh, this project 
this policy paper gives you the thrust of our assessment and recommendation. We are working now with the team on a more polished full scan report, which will also include international examples and a slightly more uh, structured narrative. We will be having a number of capacity building workshops, one later this week, where I think we expect over 160 participants on exposed evaluation and another one in May on regulatory frameworks and the announcement will be made by Strata in due course for the one on regulatory framework and we'll be working in the future on the issue of transforming our OECD general recommendations into practical support for policy implementation for the implementation roadmaps. I will stop here. Thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion and questions. Who wants to start? I will start if it's uh, it's possible. I, I've seen some members of parliament uh, participating, but I, I guess at this time, uh, wh whoever has a question can can ask and and uh, contribute to a discussion. Uh, I have some uh, some remarks, some questions uh, uh, to you. Uh, so. Uh, First of all, you've mentioned uh, civil service reform as a as an important step in order to have uh, robust uh, uh, evidence based uh, uh, decision making in Lithuania. Uh, is it in any case possible to do the objectives uh, well uh, to to reach objective objectives? Uh, that you uh, uh, have raised uh, concerning quality decision making without a civil service reform at all in Lithuania. <laughs> I want a clarification about that. The second uh, uh, thing uh, which uh, for, for me is particularly interesting is your, uh, is your uh, opinion and, and your remark about the uh, tailored programs that uh, are not uh, in many cases present in Lithuania for quality public sector. Uh, can you uh, name a few examples of how uh, maybe other countries uh, coped with similar challenges? Uh, is it, uh, uh, well, government-centered, uh, how could I say, uh, uh, well, decision to uh, set up these particular master programs, kind of programs that are that could be in use in Lithuania, and it's related with uh, uh, your remark about the hidden costs of legal inflation, uh, which is a very important thing, I guess, to uh, to uh, notice. And, uh, and a very important argument to bring to other decision makers about why we need to work in this field in order to have a quality, uh, quality decision making in Lithuania. So uh, maybe from your expertise or from your, from, from your knowledge, from your uh, uh, other uh, well, uh, assessments that you made, what is the... Uh, is it possible to estimate the hidden costs of this, uh, you know, legal inflation, and what maybe some grasps, if there are some, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, estimations or some, uh, well, uh, assessments that uh, could be of use to just uh, uh, take as an example of how uh, and what. Uh, Costs for businesses, for people, uh, these uh, this legal legal inflation uh, is uh, making. Uh, I don't know in 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 any any country that you can mention of, or in uh, in Lithuania also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very clear questions. The first is: Can we address this evidence-informed agenda without a reform of the civil service? I'm afraid the answer is no. You do need to do some reform in your civil service. I don't mean that you need to break your whole civil service frameworks, but you need, I don't think also that if you want to manage this scheme within the general framework and with the current, the current um, 
um, let's say, the current uh, framework in the Ministry of the Interior, you will not get there. All the countries that I know that have set up these analytical tracks have somehow set up a separate track, but you have to think that it is a track that will be across ministries, because when you do statistics, when you do economics, you can work on the economics of employment, of social aspects for some time, and then some people move and economies can focus on green or infrastructure. So you have to train for the long-term economies who can occupy various functions within the government, you would also hope that some of them could work for statistics Lithuania at some point and then work for the ministries. So you need both economists and you need data scientists and you need them to be able to flow around in the system. Of course, if you don't create a, separal, a special track, some of this will exist because ministries will try to hire the right people, but it will be more difficult for them to have a good value proposition for hiring them if they cannot propose to people to work in an ecosystem where people know that they can move, they can have various job opportunities. There is an issue of pay, but at the margin, you can improve the pay at the margin. We're not saying that you need to pay people at the same level as actu actuaries in the private sector, but you need to make the job interesting by increasing a number of the features and participating in professional seminars, having the opportunity to publish. I mean, that's what exists in some of the other countries. So you, you do need some form of a civil service reform. We also think that Strata would have an essential role to play to to determine the curriculum, to engage with universities, and to run the selection program, to run the selection of these people. Once these people are being selected, identified, trained, and selected, then it is the role of the government, for example, the Ministry of Finance or the Office of the Government, to dispatch these people in terms of the priorities of the government, where you need to have brain capacity to design and implement reforms. Um, that's one. One, um, one aspect. The second thing is, are there tailored programs for the quality of the public sector? The challenge is you cannot totally disconnect the notion of the academic program from the language in which they are administered. So globally, in the past, you had the English speaking world with leading universities, let's say in the UK and also in the US and also at the margin, I mean, with other countries such as Canada and Australia playing an important role. And you had a number of countries who, in a sense, decided to delegate or accepted that in order to have smart people for the public sector, they had to gain a degree in London or somewhere in the East Coast in the US to simplify. I could give, I have some names of European countries of that guy. And you had also you, but then you have the Spanish speaking world, you have the French speaking world, and you have the German speaking world. In the German speaking world, you also have a range of highly performing universities that work across Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, which are not necessarily government driven, but which go back to a long academic tradition of academic excellence and training. And in the French speaking world, that's where I come from, you had the state playing a role because the state was, in a sense, integrating the gaps of the academic world. For example, in my country, because now I can talk about what I know, the academic world in the 1940s and 50s did not have a tradition for quantitative economics, for quantitative analysis. And the state was conscious of that. The state needed people. So the state decided to set up a specific I look at Ireland, for example, which is a country of the side, size of Lithuania. Ireland does not have the same problems as Lithuania because de facto the Irish academic system is aligned with the centers of excellence in North America and in the UK. So they have excellent universities with people with people trained in that in the sort of Anglo-Saxon world. The problem in Ireland was really bringing these graduates to the public sector, but they had at least four or five universities producing a few hundred graduates a year of good quality. So the, the government did not have to intervene at that level. But when we discovered that the central bank in Lithuania was hiring people from Vietnam and from, uh, from Southern Europe and other countries who were well-trained in order to have well-trained economies to do high quality economic analysis, we thought that them, there was a problem somewhere. I'm not saying, you know, I, I, I am a, an international civil servant, so I don't know exactly 
what is missing and why Lithuania got there. And we realize your country is still relatively recent, but I think there is a, a need to invest in some of this academic curriculum. It does not mean that universities are not training people, but I think overall, we think that there are some gaps there and that maybe some, some clear action by the government. And when we think the government, this can be done by through institutions such as Strata or the Bank of Lithuania, which have academically trained people and people who know how to engage in and create partnerships with the academia where. And, um, and again, in, if I look at the Spanish speaking world, you also have an ecosystem of people who can move across large universities. I mean, in Latin America, there, there are a lot, a lot of exchanges with North America. And in Europe, Spain has a significant number of high class universities in Barcelona and Madrid, and you see them participating in networks of excellence at the European level. So I would also think that for Lithuania, the chance has to go with Europe because you can develop networks of excellence um, I mean, not very far from you, you have the St Stockholm School of Economics, which has a, a very high quality program in Stockholm. You have some other universities in London or in France, which have international partnerships. The challenge is really to plant the seeds and to have a domestically grown industry. And I think this would be helpful. And if I'm not mistaken, Lithuania has a significant financial sector. So you would assume that some of these people, the, the banks and some of the financial industry can make use of these skills. In terms of the hidden cost of legal inflation, this is tricky because normally you would say, what is the cost of regulation? So you calculate your regulatory burden and you say, that's the cost of regulation. But that's only giving you a partial picture of what's happening. Because when you have laws, they tend to bias the economic behavior of economic actors. So maybe you have less enterprises being created. You don't have the same economic development. You have companies sometimes not choosing to implant a company or factory or to not choosing to develop certain type of industries in, in Lithuania. So I think the uh, one of the good proxies is the informal economy. If I am not mistaken, when we started this project, there was a task force under the previous government trying to quantify the informal economy. And I think uh, the share was one of the highest in Europe, it was over 20% of GDP. Of course, it is hard to measure. There are, among statisticians, different ways where you, try, you can try to gauge the informal economy. But I can tell you, if your informal economy is really too high, there must be something wrong with the legal and regulatory system. That, that is, uh, for me, a very good sign of compliance. And then the, the, third, the third way to assess the cost of legal inflation is to do long-term econometric regressions of the kinds of those that have been done by the policy analysts of political and institutional systems and to compare countries in the longer term. And often, we haven't discussed that in Lithuania, the economic analysis also looks at the, the rate for settling disputes and the speed of the judicial system. Because we know that when judicial systems are too slow, like they have been in some Southern European countries, this has detrimental effects to secure clarity for the economic environment for enterprises. But we also know that when laws are being too complex and judges are lost, then it, it is more difficult to resolve disputes. So um, I don't know if I have replied to you uh, concretely, but I would look at the cost of the informal economy. I would look at the rate of creations of new businesses. I would try to benchmark the long-term economic trends of your country with its peers. That means the other Baltic and some of the uh, Eastern European countries. So because you're on the same trajectory of catch up, you know, your growth rate has to be higher than those of the more mature economies of the West of Europe. But being higher than those of, let's say, the more mature economies will not give you the catch up phase that you are still in. So you have to compare yourself with some of these peers and assess the tra trajectory in that respect. I will stop here. I hope I've tried to provide you as many facts. Thank you. Are there other questions or interventions? You can raise your hand. And there is also interpretation. If you want to raise your question in Lithuanian, this is fine as well. Anyone wants to intervene?
I see that we have several people who work for several of the parliament's members. Um, is really no one who wants to ask a question or is that too technical or? Uh, Stefan and our, our Lithuanian yes, colleagues, sure. yes, before before I just give it to Darius, um, Stefan and our Lithuanian colleagues, all of the people who are watching us uh, through YouTube and maybe on, on the same as floor, is there anywhere, anywhere that we can gather their questions in case they have them? Just, just opening that question and then we can give it to Darius straight away. If people are watching us on YouTube, you can also react to the tweets on Twitter. That is also a way to reach us at the moment. I have my Twitter account uh, on my uh, on my phone, and so you can also tweet, and we will get the message. You just have to tweet with my name, and I guess I will find you. Now, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's both to you and to our colleagues in, in, in the parliament. Uh, of course, we discussed uh, those recommendations and there will be an opportunity to address them further when we discuss an implementation plan. But what is actually this cost of legal inflation? I think that, that was a key, key conclusion for today's discussion, which and I think you framed it in a way that it may affect um, the long-term uh, trajectory of economic growth. I don't remember whether you mentioned it today, but uh, I remember that during our initial discussions, you compared France with Italy. So Italy unreformed and France reformed at some, at some point. I don't remember. I think you mentioned the reforms of President uh, de Gaulle in uh, late uh, 50s. Uh, and I think this is uh, this is a, a topic worth addressing. I understand that in your recommendation section, that's a, a strategic task force is uh, recommended. In my view, I would would welcome creation of, of this. In, in my view, it's a parliament or uh, some MP would would, would be a uh, 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 perfectly placed institutionally uh, for to lead it and, and, and perhaps to organize this 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 discussion. Uh, can we talk about it both with you if you have some sort of operational ideas and elaborate on this a little bit? I understand you had also you didn't mention it today, but you you had a discussion with with our lawyers. And if I, I, I mean, I was not able to participate, uh, unfortunately, but I understood that their conclusion was that everything is fine with lawmaking, the problem is with implementation. So uh, if, if, it's, if it's a summary of that discussion, I think it's, uh, unfortunately, that's not, 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 not a, a, right, um, a right conclusion because um, we compare to uh, this uh, legislative process and legislative machinery to a, a machine, we are, we are running a really big machine. In terms of laws, 700 laws adopted per year, uh, when we have to add uh, a high number of governmental resolutions and, and, and the other secondary legislation, ministerial orders, um, etc. So while trying to, I mean, there is no big problem of legal contradiction, although codification, I agree, is needed and what 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 would help perhaps to clarify and simplify in certain cases, but we also, I think we need to rethink it fundamentally, because we are driving a machine which absorbs an unproportionately big uh, share of I know, time and energy of civil service. I mean, I'm not talking about those skills which are inevitably needed in the modern economy and in today's data-driven world where you really need quantitative uh, uh, people who 
who are skilled in quantitative economics and 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 and, and, and management uh, of data. But I'm I mean even in the day to day uh, work uh, that if everything is consumed just uh, to keep to keep the, our legal system more or less intact that uh, those proceed uh, those amendments uh, don't contradict to each other that there is no time really or very little time to think about evidence etc so even even if you rightly raise that demand is uh, not sufficient we will be discussing in one of the workshops on, on the, how we can increase the demand for exposed uh, with this government political demand will increase but even even if demand was there my thesis is that perhaps civil service as it is today with the current machinery <laughs> Uh, legislative uh, production that's that we are being subjected to in order to change something I mean then you have to I don't know yeah maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit but so many associated legal acts which have to change to be changed that there is very little time to respond so even if the man was there I doubt that uh, the civil service uh, was able to to actually meet it. So this this system needs to be rethought fundamentally because we cannot simply service it. That's that's would be my simple uh, thesis. So this is both a comment and an invitation to to discuss perhaps first with Stefan about maybe you have some 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 ideas and and also to the members of parliament uh, whether they see it the same way because if we see if we say that yes our legal system is fine it's just the government or civil service which is too weak um uh, and and they have to to implement uh, then i mean we we will not will not get uh, very 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 far in all of these reforms. Yes, partial some partial improvements, perhaps some better supplied um, um, key decisions, perhaps better informed key decisions. Maybe some reforms, but we will be spending unproportionately uh, high and unproportionately big time on 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 basically. Uh, maintaining the the current uh, the current system, and which I think you rightly, uh, I think you are not wrong. With this. this has effects on informal economy because then businesses have difficulties in understanding uh, how and, and uh, how to comply. So here I would stop, and I would would welcome your ideas and maybe uh, some response from our uh, members of parliament. Thank you. Does anyone want to comment on that, or should I speak first and then see how parliaments react? It's a complicated answer question because a few points. Lithuania has a distinct institutional history, the history of developing a state between the two wars, I think, if I'm not mistaken, between 2020 and 2040, then resuming again 30 years ago, and the notion that democracy would equal prosperity, would equal happiness. And the equation doesn't exactly work like this, because when you open the borders, the economy and the adjustment of trade will automatically mean that your economy will catch up at some point. But there is catch up and catch up, and there is something else that economists having studied long-term economic trends have also noticed, is this famous middle income trap. When you look at many emerging economies, particularly in Latin America, some of them are facing the challenge of what they call the middle income trap. That means they're never able to catch up with the more advanced economies. At some point, the development stalls. You know, In Lithuania, when you open the borders, capital flows, people flow, automatically GDP catches up. But will it catch up forever? And I, uh, yes, and there is this notion that, that democracy is precious. So why should we change it? We waited for such a long time and now we have such a wonderful democracy. The problem democracy works, but they don't always work that well. And if you look at the philosophical literature, I'm sorry I'm talking in a personal sense now, but I have been, you know, there are, there are a lot of philosophical discussions across the world between different 
sort of economic models. And um, I have seen in academic seminars, Fukuyama, for example, as a strong political thinker, compare some of the, let's say, Asian or Confucian philosophy with some of the Western values. And just to say that plur democracy, pluralism, uh, open laws, and so forth are not always necessarily sufficient to assure economic development and prosperity. And I'm here at the OECD as an economist, so I have to think about how we can think about economics and prosperity. And when you compare France and Italy, I was raised in France, I've done many projects with the Italians 15 years ago, so I have some understanding of this country and its institutional frameworks. And the fact is, when you look at long-term economic trends, France and Italy both had, had a very ca rapid catch up towards American levels in the 1950s and 60s. But France had significant institutional reform in 1960s. But this reform did tackle the problem of regulatory inflation, but they also went beyond that. So there, there are three sort of interrelated factors. If you look at the average duration of a government, it used to be like, nine months, 10 months, one year over the, our third republic in the 1950s until 1962, 60, uh, the new constitution and the constitution has established a more stable framework. And you well know that the duration of a government in Italy is not the same as it is in some of the Western European countries. A second feature is the time of judicial appeals. And we, there has been a lot of work. I was familiar some years ago with some work even by the Bank of Italy about the economic cost of at the Lithuanian judicial system. But I can tell you that anytime you have long-term appeals before having a decision, this has an impact. And then there is the issue of the proliferation of law. And, the, and again, this goes beyond some of the just the better regulation frameworks, but the French system was radically changed in the 60s by saying that the law should not go into every detail. We have a democracy, but fixing the details is a prerogative and the responsibility of the government. And the laws have to fix the general principles. So the constitution does define what is the domain of the law and saying that all the rest is the domain of the government. Because the problem with Lithuania, when you have every law that goes into detail in a country of written law, what a law has done has to be changed by another law. So if you need to go through individual nominations, individual decisions, or everything that has to be done at the level of a law, you have to use a very heavy machinery to reach, let's say, relatively technical decisions. So you would want for the parliament to be clear and firm on the main policy options, on setting strategic directions, on creating frameworks, um, the fiscal obligations, the budget, but not necessarily on managing the details of the government, because this is not in the interest of parliament and this is not in the interest of the society. Again, here I'm talking on a personal name and we are not framing any specific recommendations there. And it is also true that when we try to discuss with some of your lawyers, given that they have seen this healthy development and Lithuania is for sure a healthy democracy, they did not, they don't, you don't necessarily see the economic cost until it hits your heart. Because if you don't do anything today, maybe in 10 or 15 years, you will compare yourself with the Estonians, for example, and you will say, why have we gone there? And why has Estonia succeeded so much? And it will invite a process of, of thinking, of strategic thinking. And what I'm telling you now is that this is something that has to be given some thoughts and it's difficult. And I think that one of the ways that you can do that is try to identify some good lawyers from some other European countries, even invite some of the Italian lawyers because they have, there is a lot of good thinking in Italy about these challenges. And if there are some exchanges with some good Italian academic centers, this is something where the Italians have a lot of experience to share. If I talk about Italy, still at some point, the the comparison is complicated by the fact that Italy is of a much larger country and it has also become a semi-federal country where a lot of the regions are making their own laws and there is interaction between the local laws and the national laws. Lithuania is a small and compact country, so that element does not contribute to the discussion in Lithuania. You don't have that level of complexity. That's where you, when you want to compare legal systems, you have to be, to be careful. But I think that the notion that democracy means that the parliaments can regulate in every detail and that you can vote to lose about anything is not something that should hold. And the challenge is 
to do that while maintaining trust in government. Because at the OECD, we have also done a lot of work on trust in government. We know that democracies at the moment are being challenged by many foreign powers, and governments have to show that they can be reliable, that they can be trusted. We have defined five key characteristics for trust, including responsiveness to citizens' needs, um, competence, reliability, integrity, openness. So you have to maintain all of that. But you can keep all of that while not necessarily having laws that go in every detail. The challenge is that you have to exchange with countries that have a similar legal culture because you cannot, you know, laws, you have language and then you have legal cultures. So you will have to think to promote exchange with other continental European countries who have had some success at addressing some of these issues. I'm not sure if you would want to discuss with countries such as the Netherlands or Austria, because maybe Germany is too big and is also so federal that the size is different. And maybe some of your, your well succeeding neighbors such as um, Estonia and maybe uh, Finland or Sweden. So that's where I would group some thinking. I would invite some lawyers, some well-known economists and for them to, to to provide some form of a report thinking or, or having some seminars so that you can put the issues on the table and think about what can be done. Because I'm not saying, you know, the, uh, the people who, who did the French constitutional reform in the 1960s, Michel Debré, he died. His two sons, one of them has been the head of the French constitutional court for some time. So they still had a very influential long shadow on the French legal system. Since then, some of the lessons, you know, I mean, the French system has also drifted over time, but I still believe that um, there is something that needs to be done, but that's not something for which I can give clear OECD advice that would be rooted in OECD, let's say, instrument and practices, because this goes a bit beyond, but we think beyond our special specific remit for evidence-informed policymaking, but we think that the country would give itself a service by being able to think strategically as to what are the issues that require the level of attention of the parliament in a democratic context that have to be debated and discussed in parliament. Because I can also tell you that I've seen in my own country recently or in countries where the government can legislate by law decrees, this can be criticized. You know, often governments sometimes they want to do quick reforms on big issues and they go outside parliament by doing law decrees. And you have to create clear frameworks and criteria for managing law decrees, which is another, you, you have to, to define limits to the domain of the law and maybe give some powers for the government to do some law decrees, which at the moment does not exist in Lithuania, but you have to carefully nail down how these powers can be used for which purposes, which duration. This is not like writing a blank check, because like any other issue, any other systems, they can be abused, you know, and I'm not going to go into controversial discussions, but I know that every time in my country, the government goes with ordinances that is outside the normal, the normal process of the law, there are issues that are being raised, and these issues were raised recently for some of the government reforms. So again, so that's, these are tools that have to be manipulated with caution, I also realize that the history of democracy is more recent in Lithuania than it is, let's say, in some of the other Western European countries. This is a fact of life. So, and I think that, again, I have been in your country, we have been working with you for one year now, but I don't read your language in detail, so I cannot express how these safeguards should be expressed, how consensus should be formed on these issues, which is why I think that some of these issues could be addressed as part of a committee for the future of the parliament or some groups of legal experts. But I think you need to bring outside perspectives because some of the inside perspectives, they don't necessarily realize that you have a problem. I would also frame things a bit differently, you see. Lithuania overall has seen a rapid catch up of its economic situation. So even though in some ways you're still a middle income economy, you're still way more prosperous than you were 20 years ago. So you may not realize that you have a problem because people think, oh, but I'm living now much better than I used to maybe 20 years ago. So there is a feel good factor, but you may not realize what you're missing and what are the opportunities that you could have achieved by doing things better. You see what I mean? 
that's the whole challenge because that the situation is not catastrophic. The situation is improving. You have European regulatory frameworks that apply across the board. So the challenge is to fine tune that in the smart sense. And I think these are sensitive issues, which is why you need to form consensus over time. And as was mentioned by Darius, when we engage with some of your very distinguished lawyers, I did not find too much traction or too much notion that those could have a long-term economic impact and that some attention should be given to these issues. So at first point, you have to find some form of a domestic source of inspiration of people who can frame these issues and frame this debate. And the challenge with sharing experiences across countries is that you have to identify the right factors because sometimes people will say, oh, but this country you know, is 10 times bigger than us or they have this and this and we don't have that. And of course this is true. But again, I have seen some worrying signals. When you say that Lithuania needs 700 laws a year and other countries have much fewer, another way to calculate burdens would be to look just at the, state, the, um, the number of pages in the statute book, which in most Western democracies has increased a lot over time. That would be a good indicator for regulatory inflation. And the third signal is a very high share of the informal economy. For me, this is like a patient with fever. Lithuania is not sick, but it has some fever. And you have a, an underlying disease that needs to be cured. That's my sense as an economist. I would stop here. Any reactions from anyone in parliament or? I, I have not been controversial enough. I've been too diplomatic. Well, I think that uh, nobody uh, can add uh, anything after after you. So that's a good sign. I guess that we are uh, well uh, running out of time. It's one hour and uh, and a half we have been discussing. So. Um, I guess we are we are going to wrap up our our session. For me, it's uh, it was a very interesting uh, discussion and then very very good remarks about our progress. I think that your last thought about uh, the ambition, the size of the ambition that we have since and you know uh, when we talk about regulatory framework, uh, uh, evident uh, evidence based decision making and uh, many other aspects of uh, political uh, life it's 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 a very important thing what what we aim to do in the future if we are going to uh, to 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 still remain as uh, well uh, a quite uh, peaceful place uh, in our well and and quite uh, successful place but just quite successful place compared to european union standards then of course the robust reforms may be are not needed. But if we are going to well achieve uh, the success that uh, uh, and other countries uh, uh, of European Union or in the world has achieved, we are looking also again into uh, example of Ireland, for example, with a huge. Uh, so it's it's a clear uh, it's a clear message that we are aim to to uh, to stay in the reform path, and if we have uh, uh, quite an understanding of what to do, uh, we have no reason to uh, to you know uh, excuse ourselves and uh, say you know we are not going to do that reforms. We are not going to improve evidence uh, making and uh, evidence uh, based decisions in Lithuania. So for me and uh, for others who uh, were watching, I think it was a, a really interesting session. I hand over to Yedrus if uh, he has some conclusion remarks, remarks to make. Uh, thank you, Vitaltas. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, the Deputy Speaker of, of Seimas has said already the most important things. I believe that we are in the middle of discussion, and this uh, session has provided evidence on evidence informed policy making that is needed for further steps. 
and that uh, that uh, now we are at at the at the moment that uh, the consensus is being gathered to, to decide on on what ways and what steps will be taken uh, in the uh, further so some steps are, are already in the government program and Darius has mentioned that uh, i could add that there are of course many smaller uh, smaller steps are also underway by the way we have uh, discussed with Vilnius University the possibility of establishing a program on, on um, public sector analytics. So that, that is also possible and, and we can go that way. And um, if uh, we uh, agree and, and keep this uh, momentum, so I believe that uh, these roadmaps that will be prepared together with OECD experts could be of, of very good use. They could be uh, utilized for further policy making process both on the side of government and on the side of parliament so i, I would like to again uh, thank very much uh, the members of the parliament for for listening to us and uh, of course our experts from from oecd from Paris that we are so keen to to uh, and so open to the need of, of this dialogue and of course to Darius who was uh, along with without us uh, uh, in of this debate. Uh, thank you very much from my side. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much, Stefan, Claire, Richard. I thank members of the SEMAS and all who watched uh, this uh, discussion.